Hi there, and welcome to our online service. We're trusting that you'll be encouraged and uplifted by today's message. If this is your first time joining us, then an extra special welcome to you. We'd love to direct you to our website where you can access our online visitors brochure, which will give you some great information about our church. And we also hope to see you soon at one of our services in the church building. All of our service times are available on the church website and our social media platforms will keep you updated with everything happening in the life of our church. Then just a reminder that if you have any prayer requests, you can contact us via the email address on screen. Our team would love to connect with you and pray for your needs. Yes, now giving to God is one of our values at Rivers Church. And we'd encourage you to use any one of the electronic means available to give your tithes and offerings to God through the local church. In Malachi 3.10, the Lord says, bring all the tithes into the store so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, I will open the window of heaven for you. I'll pour a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Our giving builds the church and enables us to do what God has called us to do, to reach and influence people for Jesus. And God promises to pour out His blessings over our lives when we give out of obedience with a heart for the kingdom. Well, we hope that you are ready for today's message. Let's lean in and be encouraged. Hi Church, this Easter, the Rivers Foundation is looking forward to putting a smile on our beneficiary children's faces by adding a treat of chocolate marshmallow Easter eggs to their meals. We would love your help. You can bring in boxes of Beacon's original milk chocolate marshmallow eggs like this and drop it off at the Foundation stand. Together, let's make this Easter special for our beneficiary children. Join us as we gather to reflect on a creative God that gave us the mandate to create for His glory. This Thursday, 6 p.m. Coffee, music, art from 6 p.m. Wonderful. Well, how are you all doing today? Are you all happy? Are you glad to be in the house? Are you glad at school holidays? Ah, some of you are like, no. Keep my kids at school. It is school holidays, but uh, good to have you in the house today. And uh, as you uh, heard earlier, there's a lot happening in the life of church at the moment. And I just want to uh, mention a couple of things quickly before we go to the Word. Uh, this Friday is youth. Every Friday is a youth at church for all our teenagers. But this Friday, we've got Pastor Chris from our Santon campus, and uh, he's going to be with our young people. And uh, I have to say, I have to brag on our youth ministry. We have an incredible youth ministry with amazing leaders and volunteers and young people that come hang out. And so if you're a teenager, if you've got teenagers, don't be hanging out with all the scollies and all those other people out there. Bring your kids to youth. 
and uh, we got a fantastic youth program. And then uh, you might remember that towards the end of last year, around Miracle Offering time, uh, we mentioned that uh, one of the things we were giving towards uh, for Miracle Offering was to purchase a new vehicle for the Rivers Foundation. Well, the good news is, is that we've just purchased that vehicle and uh, you can see it there. And uh, that's, that's going to go a long way to uh, helping us with all our deliveries and everything else we need to transport through the Rivers Foundation. So once again, thank you to everyone who plays a part week in, week out, month in, month out, faithfully, consistently giving. And it's always good when we can see where our giving goes. Well, I hope you're ready for the word. Come stand to your feet. We're going to pray and then we'll get straight into it today. Just put your hand on your heart. Father God, we love you. We're so grateful for you. Thank you for your word, Lord, that is really a roadmap for life and for eternity. And as we go to the word today, Holy Spirit, would you just bring to life my words? Would you speak beyond the things I say? Uh, would your words penetrate our hearts today as we lean in, as we choose to be responsive? Thank you for every person here today. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's awesome people said, Amen, amen. You can take your seats. Tell the person next to you, you're lucky you're sitting next to me. Well, today I'm going to do a standalone message, but uh, in many ways, it's actually going to follow on from what we've been speaking about over the past two weeks on developing a daily quiet time with God. Now, before I give you the title today, I need to tell you a pretty cool story. There was a man by the name of Gaylord Kambarami, and he was the general secretary of the Bible Society in Zimbabwe. And on one particular occasion, he was sharing his faith with another man, and he tried to give the man a New Testament Bible. But this man was very reluctant. Uh, he was arrogant. He was a heathen. He didn't believe in God. He didn't think the Bible could add any value to his life. But anyway, he reluctantly accepted this New Testament Bible. But he also insisted that he would uh, roll the pages of this Bible to make his cigarettes with. Well, uh, anyway, Mr. Kambarami said, okay, he said, look, that's fine. But on one condition, at least promise me that you will read each page of the New Testament before you roll it into your cigarettes. Well, anyway, the man agreed and the two went their separate ways. And they never met again until 15 years later when they bumped into each other at a, a conference uh, in Zimbabwe. And, and the man who had smoked the pages of the Bible had since got saved. And uh, he was actually now a full-time evangelist and he happened to be the speaker at that conference. And when he got up on the platform, he said to his audience, he said, I smoked Matthew, I smoked Mark, I smoked Luke, I smoked all the way to John 3.16. And he said, at that moment, my life was changed and I could no longer continue to smoke the pages of the Bible. Aren't you glad that the Bible is not just words on paper? Aren't you glad that it's not just someone's random thoughts and opinions? Aren't you glad that the Bible is not just another story to make us feel good? You see, the Bible is the living Word of God. It is everything that God wants and needs to say to us contained in the book of Scripture. And it has the power to transform even the hardest and the most stubborn heart. Now, there's a wonderful book by Howard Hendricks called Living by the Book. And in it, he says, the Bible was not written to satisfy your curiosity, but to make you conform to Christ's image. Not to make you a smarter sinner, but to make you like the Savior. Not to fill your head with a collection of biblical facts, but to transform your life. And so today I want to speak to you on the life transforming power of the word. The life-transforming power of the Word. Now, I want to read to you a verse from the book of Hebrews that uh, many of you would be familiar with. It's Hebrews 4 verse 12. And the Bible says, The Word of God is, a, <clears throat> sorry, is alive and powerful. Everyone say alive, alive. and powerful. powerful. The Word of God is alive and powerful. 
It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Isn't that amazing, eh? The Bible is alive and powerful. What does that mean? Well, it means that it's as relevant to us today as it was to those who first wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I, I guess you could say the Bible is like this, this living, breathing organism, and it hasn't lost any of its power. It hasn't lost any of its effectiveness. It hasn't lost its ability to transform even the hardest of hearts. And the thing with the Bible is that it can never be outdated. Now, now some of you, if you're old enough, might remember the Y2K phenomena. Remember Y2K? That was the buzzword at the end of the 1990s. And Y2K was a shorthand term for the year 2000. And we were all told with absolute authority that the moment computers clicked over from 1999 to 2000, that the digital world was going to descend into chaos. Remember that? We were told computers and computer systems all around the world were going to crash. But guess what? Nothing happened. It just ticked over. It was another day and everything pretty much continued as per normal. So, so it was proven to be a false alarm. Now, what was interesting in leading up to that, uh, that turn of the century moment, there were many books that were written around this Y2K phenomena. Uh, one of them was the Y2K Survival Guide. And uh, it, it said everything you need to know to get you from this side of the crisis to the other. But how many of you know this book and every other book like it is now completely irrelevant? Isn't that right? They predicted all these things. None of them happened. There is nothing useful that that book can tell us today. But here's the thing, church. The Bible is not like that. The Bible has never become irrelevant. It will never be outdated. It will be as applicable to every single generation that continues to live on this earth until Jesus comes back. It is alive and it is powerful. And uh, Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 35, he said, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Now, there was this old lady who uh, came home from church one day, and when she got home, she realized there was an intruder in her house busy robbing her. And uh, so she very boldly plucked up the courage and she yelled out, stop, Acts 2, 38. And uh, the burglar immediately froze in, in, in fright there and almost as if he was paralyzed. Anyway, the old lady went to phone the police. They very quickly came and, and they arrested the man. And while the policeman was handcuffing this guy, uh, he said to him, how come you just stood there? All this lady did was quote you a Bible verse. To which the intruder responded, he said, he said, a Bible verse. She said that she had an ax and two thirty eights. Listen, the Word of God is powerful. The moment you begin to clear it over your life and over your situations, things begin to change. It is our resistance towards everything the enemy tries to bring into our lives and everything he tries to take away from us. Why? Because as the Word says, it is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. You know, the thing with a sword is this, is that a sword only has power if it's used. You know, you can have the world's sharpest sword. It can be next to you on the table there, but, but it's powerless unless you pick it up and you begin to wield it. And it's the same with the Word of God. God's Word is powerless in our lives unless we actually pick it up and we begin to use it. Unless you begin to read it and ingest it and be make it part of your life and begin to act out on what it says, only then does the Word actually have transforming power in your life. And, and, and church, remember this. The devil is not scared of a Bible covered in dust. You can have the latest version of King James, Message, New Living, NIV. You can have them all on your bookshelf at home. Leather bound. The devil's not scared of any of those. 
But the moment you begin to read that and you begin to apply it to your life, that's what strikes fear into the heart of the enemy. The theologian R.C. Sproul once said that, uh, I think the greatest weakness in the church today is that almost no one believes that God invests his power in the Bible. Everyone is looking for a program, uh, in a, for, sorry, everyone is looking for power in a program, in a methodology, in a technique, in anything and everything but that in which God has placed it, his word. He alone has the power to change lives for eternity and that power is focused on the scriptures. So let's have a look at some ways today in which the Word of God has the ability to transform our lives. You all okay today? Wonderful. The first thing is this, is that it feeds our spirit. The Word of God feeds our spirit. You know, every day we feed our bodies. Isn't that right? Most people have at least three meals a day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, bit of snacking in between that. And, uh, you know, if you're like my teenage boys, I mean, they eat at least six to eight times a day. And in fact, they, they're always eating. They just every now and then they come up for air and then they go back down to, to eating. It seems like that's all they do. But, but our, our bodies are designed to eat food. Isn't that correct? You know, without food, we, we can't live. We can't survive. We can't grow. We can't be energized. We can't function properly without food. But you know, people often forget that although we are a physical body, we are not just a body. We are body and we are spirit. The body is temporary. The spirit is eternal. And yet sadly, most people spend far more time investing into their bodies than they do investing into their spirit. Remember this, you are not a body with a spirit you are a spirit with a body. Because God has created us to live for eternity, but he's given us a temporary body for the time that he gives to us. And uh, th th there's something that I'm sure most of you have, have heard of, uh, anorexia. You all know what anorexia is. It's an eating disorder whereby people starve themselves because they're obsessed with their weight or how they look. And the thing is this, is that when you starve yourself physically, that's what you will end up looking like behind me. And if you keep that up for long enough, guess what? Well, eventually you will die. And there's a great spiritual parallel there as well, because if you don't feed yourself spiritually, you will end up with what we call spiritual anorexia. Now, you may still look good on the outside. I mean, you may have abs like, you know, six pack, eight pack. You might have biceps and muscles and tight buns of steel and all those other things. You can have all that on the outside, but on the inside, you will be starving because you are spiritually malnourished. And guess what? If you keep that up for long enough in your life, eventually you will end up dying spiritually. Can I remind you again? I know some of this is basic stuff. But the word of God is food for your spirit. You know, we often use the term daily bread. That's what the Bible is. It is daily bread for our spirits. Jesus taught us to pray, give us today our daily bread. Not just speaking of physical food, but also the food that would feed your spirit. And every time you open the scriptures, you are energizing, you are nourishing your spirit. You are feeding your spirit so that you can function the way God has designed you to do. Now, I want to ask you a question, and it's, it's, it's quite a weighted question. If you ate food as often as you read the Word, what would you look like physically? Yeah, just let that sink in for a moment there. If you ate food as often as you read the Word, what would you look like physically? And the answer to that question will tell you whether you are currently suffering with spiritual anorexia. Now, I know some of you would say, well, if that were the, you know, if that question, if I applied it to my life, you'd be strong, you'd be healthy, you'd be robust, because I know some of you spend a lot of time in the Word. But I think the reality is that probably more than half the people here might say, ooh, yo, 
I might be a bit underweight. Yeah, you might be, but you might also be thin and starving and almost gaunt-like because, listen, some Christians only feed on the Word the days they come to church. I know for some of you, this is your daily dose of food, of spiritual food. But imagine for a moment, if you only ate once a week on a Sunday, what would your physical appearance look like? You see, don't just focus on feeding your body. You have to feed your spirit. Now, between 1876 and 1878, uh, in India, there was something known as the Great Famine of India. And this resulted from an intense drought that caused multiple crop failures, particularly in the southern region of India. And it said that over 8 million people died of starvation. And in fact, everywhere you went at that time, that's what people look like. People look like that. Now, here's the thing. If, 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 if you and I were able to see the spiritual condition of people, you know what? Every time you went to Gateway Mall and down to Mshlanga and pretty much everywhere else, if we could see the spiritual condition of people, that's what we would see. Because on the outside, people appear to have it all together. They've got all the luxuries and they've got good jobs and nice homes and cars, but people are neglecting the Word of God. People are feeding their spirits or all sorts of other rubbish, feeding at Netflix, feeding at social media, feeding at all the ideologies and stuff that's out there. But when you neglect the feeding of your spirit through the Word of God, unfortunately, that's what your spirit looks like. Can I appeal to you again, as I do almost every Sunday? Get into the Word of God. Open your Bible, begin to read it, begin to ingest it, because only the Word has the power to transform your life. Can you say amen to that? The second thing is this, is that the Word changes our thinking. That's the life-transforming power of the Word. It changes our thinking. You know, at the time when the Soviet Union was still a communist state, that was up until 1991, uh, it was actually illegal to have a Bible in the Soviet Union. And so when missionaries would try to reach the people there, they would have to smuggle Bibles in and uh, hope that they didn't get caught. But whenever you tried to enter a Soviet state at any one of the border posts, you would almost always get asked this question. They would ask you, do you have any guns, drugs, or Bibles? Isn't that interesting, eh? Do you have any guns, drugs, or Bibles? Now, now even though it was highly unlikely that these communist soldiers had ever read the Bible, they believed it to be as dangerous as guns and drugs. You know, if you think about it, what do guns do? Guns injure you or, or kill the body. What do drugs do? Drugs alter the mind. But these communists believed that the Bible was a dangerous weapon because it had the power to alter your mind by changing the way that you think. You see, in this atheistic society and setup there, uh, you know, they believed that if people could read the Bible, well, it would begin to change the way they think. And if their way they thought changed, then the state would lose control over the people. Because the people would realize that they no longer had to be in bondage, but there was actually the chance of freedom. And you see, that's what the Word of God does. It does what no government can do. It does what no philosophy can do. It does what no political ideology can do. It frees us from bondage. It instills hope into us for the future. Why? Because it changes the way that we think. You know, that's why even... Today, the Bible is still under attack, not just in uh, Eastern Bloc countries, but in in, in our Western countries. Suppose that Christian countries, the Bible is still under attack. Why? Because the devil knows that when people begin to read and apply the word, it starts to change their thinking. And the more they begin to think like God, the less they begin to think like the enemy and the less control he has over our lives. So he will do anything he can to keep people from reading the Word of God. Because you know what? Listen, you cannot read the Bible regularly and stay negative. You can't. 
You can't read the Bible consistently and stay critical of everything around you. You can't read the Bible consistently and stay ungrateful. You can't read the Bible regularly and stay depressed. Why? Because the Bible changes how you think. It changes how you think about yourself, how you think about life, how you think about your problems. Everything in our head begins to change when we begin to apply the Word of God to our lives. And not only that, but we also begin to discern and pick out the lies and the mistruths that society is feeding us. You know, lies about uh, identity or gender. You know, the world tells us now there's at least 78 different genders. You know, the Bible is very clear. There are two genders. You are male or you are female, and God alone determines which one you are. You know, lies about our origins. You know, we're told you came from a monkey. Your uncle was a monkey. His uncle, his cousin, they were all monkeys. No, we knew. We, that, that's not true. The Bible says we are divinely created in the image of God with purpose to our lives. You know, it begins to change our thinking about all the lies we've been told to embrace about homosexuality and transgenderism. It begins to change what we've been taught to believe about abortion. Yeah, that fetus is just a lump of tissue anyway. No, it's not. That is a living person created in the image of God. You see, the more you begin to read the word, the more you begin to align your thinking with God. You begin to rationalize with God. Everything about your thinking changes when we begin to dig deeper into the word. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you, the way you think then. You will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Can you say amen to that? So the word feeds our soul. It changes our thinking. Then thirdly, it transforms our behavior. It transforms our behavior. Now, something that is uh, used quite often in the psychology industry is a term called behavior modification. How many of you have ever heard that? Behavior modification. And and it's where they use various motivational techniques to try and change behavior patterns in people over time. Now, in theory, it's a good idea. Uh, The problem, though, is that until the inside of a person is changed, nothing on the outside will be permanent or lasting. Isn't that true? Until you change the heart of a man, his behavior will never be permanent or lasting. So, you know, things like anger. You can suppress anger for a while through behavior modification. You can try really, really hard to be nice, but eventually you're going to have that same outburst of anger again, unless the heart is changed. The same is true with habits and addictions. You can suppress those addictions for a while, but eventually if your heart is not changed, your behavior is eventually going to follow suit again. You know, it's kind of like we often say, trying to put a plaster on a big open wound. You can cover that wound, but unless you deal with the root issue, all it is is a covering. That's really what behavior modification is. And God is more interested in changing our hearts than he is in our behavior, because if he can change the heart, the behavior change will be lasting and permanent. So, you know, our lives, our actions, everything we do will always be consistent with the state of our hearts. You know, we often use the phrase roots and fruits. The root of something will always determine the fruit. Uh, Jesus taught about this too. He said, uh, if the tree is good, it will only produce good fruit. If the tree is bad, it can only ever produce bad fruit. And unless you change the heart of a person, you will never be able to permanently change the outward behavior. And, and church, that's why the preaching of the word is so important. That's why you opening the Bible in your quiet time reading the word is so important. Because the word is not designed by God to bring behavior modification. The word is given to us by God to completely and totally transform our lives and to transform our hearts because when the heart is changed, the behavior will automatically follow. Can you say amen to that? Now, I want to just spend a few minutes 
uh, uh, sharing with you on a study that was done by the Center for Bible Engagement at the Taylor University in Indiana. And 40,000 people were surveyed across the general population. So they didn't intentionally look for Christians or non-Christians. 40,000 random people between the age of 8 and 80 And they were trying to assess how people were engaging Scripture. In other words, were they reading the Bible? And if they were reading the Bible, how regularly were they reading the Word? But what's interesting is that uh, in their survey, they actually discovered something that they were actually not looking for. But it ended up becoming the main um, uh, diagnosis of, of the survey that they did. And it related to the amount of times that people read their Bibles each week. And I want to just mention some of this to you. The survey showed that people who uh, are only in the Word once a week, and and that would include coming to church. Because obviously you come to church, we, we go to the Scriptures, we speak from the Word. People who are only in the Word once a week showed almost zero change to their behavior. Almost nothing. Then people who were in the Word twice a week was exactly the same. There was almost zero change in their behavior. People who were in the Word three times a week, there was a slight change to their behavior. They described it almost like a a little blip on the map. Like there was just a little heartbeat, like I think something has changed. But the amazing thing that it found was that for people who are in the Word four times a week, it actually spiked off the chart there was such a significant change in their behavior that took place. The moment you are in the word four or more times a week. Now, now, now most of us would assume that a, a survey like that would show a bit of a gradual increase. No times a week, one time a week, two times, three times, four times, and it would go up. But that's not what the survey showed. It showed that something radically happens in your behavior when you commit to at least four times a week in the Word. And, and I want to just share with you some of the things they found that changed. Feeling lonely dropped by 30%. Anger issues dropped by 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped by 40%. Listen to this one. Alcoholism dropped by 57%. So if you are here today, you love the Lord, but you can't seem to let go of alcohol, it's pretty much guaranteed that you are not spending at least four times a week in the Word. Because the moment you are, you're less, 57% less likely to engage in alcohol. It also went on to say feeling spiritually stagnant dropped by 60%. That feeling when, oh, God is far away and I'm dry on the inside, changed by 60%. Viewing pornography. Dropped by 61%. And again, I know there are some of you who are battling in this area and you can't understand why. The moment you increase your reading of the Bible, it changes the hold that these things have over your life. But then on the flip side of it, sharing your faith with others increases by 200%. And discipling others increased by 230%. You know, people often wonder, why, why can't I share my faith? Every time I try, I get heart palpitations and my hands go sweaty. And ah. The moment you're in the Word at least four times a week, it becomes a natural outflow of your changed behavior and lifestyle. You know, when I read this, the results of the survey, it actually helped me a lot. Because one of the things I've often wondered as a pastor is why is it that some people are in church every single Sunday, but nothing ever seems to change in their life. There are people in churches all around the world, they, they, their hands are lifted in worship, but they have the same relationship issues. They keep sniffing cocaine. They have all the same issues that they have. Why doesn't anything change? Well, these findings show why it doesn't change. Because unless you are a person of the word committed to at least four times a week, the likelihood of your outward behavior changing is almost zero. If you want to change your behavior, change the amount of times you get into the word each week. Can you say amen to that? D.L. Moody once said that the scriptures were not given to increase our knowledge, but to change 
our lives. The fourth thing is this, the life transforming power of the word. It shows us as we really are. You all still okay? It shows us as we really are. Now there's a story of a, a group of missionaries in the early 1900s who were trying to get access to work with a remote African tribe. And uh, in order to get access to them, what they did was they sent them a number of gifts. And, and included in these gifts was a package of small hand mirrors. Now bear in mind, this tribe was such a remote tribe that they'd never seen their own reflection before, except in water. They'd never actually seen their face in a mirror. And so, you know, when, when they got these mirrors, I mean, it was like a whole new world opened for them. And so they invited the missionaries to come in and share the word with them. Uh, and, and then in one particular region, there was the daughter of the king. She was the princess of that village. She'd been told that she was the most beautiful woman in the world. Okay. And so when she heard of this amazing instrument that would show her just how beautiful she was, well, she invited all the missionaries to come, provided they brought a mirror for her. Anyway, they got there, and uh, she demanded to be given one of these mirrors uh, so that she could have a look at herself. The truth, however, was that this princess was actually the least attractive person in this tribe of villagers. And so when she took the mirror back into her, uh, uh, her tent, she had a good long look at what she thought was going to be her beauty. And when she held the mirror up, she saw what she looked like and she was horrified. And the story says that she broke that glass. Uh, she banished the missionaries from that village. And she also made a new law that no one was ever allowed to bring a mirror into the tribe again. I mean, it's quite a bizarre story, but, 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 but the question is, why did the princess hate the mirror? Well, the reason she hated it is because it told her the truth about herself, that she was actually an ugly woman. That's what it showed her. And she didn't like that. And you know, that's why so many people oppose the Bible. Because church, the Bible is like a mirror. It always shows you as you truly are. That verse in Hebrew says it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The Bible will always show you the true state of your heart. You see, most people like to think that they are good. You know, you try to share your faith with someone. Often their first response is, no, I'm a good person. No, I'm a nice guy. No, I don't, I don't need that. But you see, the Bible shows us the true condition of our heart. It shows us as we really are. And people don't want to know that. People want to think they're amazing and everything revolves around them. But look what the Bible says. Psalm 53 verse 2. God looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. But no, all have turned away. All have become corrupt. No one does good, not a single one. And you thought you came to church to be encouraged today. But that's what the Bible does. It shows us as we really are apart from Christ. But wait, it gets worse. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we put on our prized robes of righteousness, we find that they are but filthy rags. You see, the Bible always, like a mirror, shows you who you really are. And until we come to that realization, there's actually nothing that can be done to change us. Here's something you can write down today. This is very important. Until you know you're a sinner, you'll never understand your need for a Savior. Until you know you're a sinner, you will never understand your need for a savior. The Presbyterian minister Paul Hovey once said, men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. And lastly, just as we finish up today, the life transforming power of the word, fifthly, is that it shows us the way back to God. It shows us the way back to God. You know, if all the Bible did was show us how bad we are, well, we would not be encouraged by that. 
Because every time we'd read it, we'd think, oh, I'm bad. Oh, I'm so bad. I'm really, really bad. But thank God the Bible doesn't leave us there. It shows us how bad we are so that we understand how much we need Jesus and how much we need God's intervention in our lives. One of my favorite quotes of all time is by Pastor James Merritt, and I've, I've included it on the back of my devotional. And he says, the primary purpose of reading the Bible is not to know the Bible, but to know God. See, that's what the scriptures do. They show us the way back to God. Yes, the Bible gives us everything we need for this life. It gives us guidance. It gives us wisdom. It gives us direction. It helps us make right decisions. All those practical things. But the Bible is even more than that. The Bible shows us the way back to God. And it also shows us that there is only one way back to God. And that is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, the wonderful thing about the Bible is that it actually simplifies your life. Because no longer do you have to spend your whole life trying to find the way back to God. God's already shown us the way back to Him. It's revealed to us in His Word. And the way back to God is always and only through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me finish with this great quote by John Wesley. He was the founder of the Methodist movement. And he, say, he, he would say, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way. For this very end, he came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. And then he says, let me be a man of one book. The scriptures have everything we need to transform our lives. Just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. I want to just take this opportunity before we finish up to pray for people and to commit you to God. If you are here today and you've never made the decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, friend, then you are on the wrong path. You are on the road to destruction and eternal separation from God. God has revealed Himself to us through Jesus. And everyone who puts their trust in Christ is reconciled to God the Father. The Bible tells us that, that sin separates us from God. It's what sin always does. It separates us from God. That's why we need a Savior to reconcile us to God. Jesus is that Savior. The sinless Son of God took on human form. He died on a Roman cross. His blood washes us clean. And when we put our faith and our trust in Him, we are made right with our Creator. If you've never made that decision to receive Christ as Lord, you can do so in these next few moments. Or perhaps you're here today and, and maybe at some point you have made that decision. But if you're honest, maybe you've backslidden. Maybe you've fallen away. Maybe you've drifted from God. You've done a whole lot of things you know you shouldn't have done. And it's put distance between you and God. Friend, would you come back to God today? Would you make that decision to say, Lord, I'm going to recommit to you. I'm going to put my trust in you again. You know, the good thing is that God never turns away anyone who comes to Him with a sincere and repentant heart. And in a moment, I'm going to count to three. And on that count of three, if you need to make this decision for the first time or you need to come back to God today, then when I count to three, I'm going to ask you just to put up your hand nice and high. No one's looking around. But I'll see it, acknowledge it. Then you can put it back down. And I'm going to include you in a short prayer. On the count of three, one, two, three. Lift your hand nice and high. Nice and high. Thank you, 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 thank you. In the balcony, thank you, thank you, thank you at the back. God bless. Thank you over there. Many people responding. Thank you on the side. God bless. If you haven't raised your hand or if I haven't seen it, just pop it up quickly nice and high. We're almost done, but I don't want to miss out on anyone. Thank you. God bless. Wonderful. People responding to Christ. Thank you. God bless. 
Come church, I want us to pray together, but especially those who've, who've made this decision today. Pray with me, Father God, thank you that you love me so much. Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for my sins. Today I open my heart to you. I repent of my sins, Lord. I confess my desperate need for you. And I declare you to be Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Make me new. Thank you that today I'm a child of God because I've received Christ as Lord. Thank you that I have a hope and a future and the promise of eternal life. I surrender to you in full. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, come on church, let's thank the Lord for those who responded. Many, many people responding and making that decision for Jesus. What a wonderful thing you've just won, uh, just done. And if that was you, I'd love to just direct you to the info counter after the service. And uh, our team's got a little booklet there for you that you can take home and it'll help you uh, discover the next step in your walk of faith with God. One of them, which is baptism. And uh, how good was it seeing people get baptized in the service this morning? We're gonna be baptizing people in our next service as well. And uh, we'd love to walk alongside you in your journey of faith. Well, it's been a fantastic morning in church. Just a reminder that uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to give yet, you can do so at the exits or at the info counter. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.